Hey everybody, today I am going to be talking about my top five most underrated Sopranos episodes, and I'm doing this, of course, in preparation for The Many Saints of Newark, which is coming out very soon. The Many Saints of Newark, of course, being a Sopranos story from the past, and so um, I figured it would be kind of cool to go back and talk about The Sopranos, because as many people know who watch this channel, I am a die-hard Sopranos fan, and it is my favorite show of all time, without question. But, you know, there are episodes that I really like that I feel like a lot of people do not talk about very often. And it's like, you know, I could come on here and talk about my favorite episodes, but it's like, you know, everybody has talked about those episodes. Everyone has talked about, like, Test Dream and, and White Caps, Pine Barrens, Employee of the Month College. All of those have been talked about just, I feel like, to death. And so I thought I might talk about some episodes that I think are a little bit underrated. Before I get into that, I'm going to plug my website. As always, it is deepfocuslens.com. I am an artist and I do commission portraits and I sell prints of my work. If that's something that you're interested in, you can always go to the website. And if you have a question about a commission or anything like that, you can always email me. My email is in the description box below. These are really in no particular order. So I'll just start with uh, my first one. And this is Calling All Cars. This is season four, episode 11. This is an episode that I, I didn't love the first time I saw it, you know, it just it just felt like another episode to me. But it's one of those when you watch the whole show in context and then you go back and watch the show, you realize there's a lot there. The episode on its own is one of those where really not that much happens in the big scheme of things in terms of progressing the plot forward. But yet thematically, there's a lot there that echoes a lot of the themes and the things that we would see as the show draws to a close. And I think it's a very, very haunting episode uh, because it is so much about death and so much about The Sopranos is the obsession with death, with the end. And this episode feels like a bunch of characters who are sort of in this in-between stage, but they're kind of learning to accept that death is imminent and that it is coming, and perhaps sooner than they thought. Even with Tony, I think it's very interesting that he uh, decides he doesn't want to do therapy anymore in this episode, or he starts to kind of say, you know, we know that this is kind of bullshit and I'm just kind of wasting my time here and it's time to do something about it. That in itself, I think, is is kind of interesting. Uh, the, the, the sequencer, I should say, the whole story, you know, about Bobby is, is quite heartbreaking. But his, you know, his whole storyline in this episode is about accepting death, knowing that as much as it's hard to admit, Janice is right, you know, he does need to move on. He needs to move on for the sake of his loved ones. And there's a line that she says, I know it's Janice, because Janice, you know, I think in this episode she shows some real intelligence here, but she also shows some of the most deplorable behavior in terms of the way that she manipulates Bobby's children here. Um, but she says a line, and I don't remember it exactly, but I always thought it was a really good line, you know, her saying that, you know, basically, the dead don't even really care what we have to say. It's our own narcissism that makes us think that they, they do care. Something along those lines, and I think that's a, a really interesting one. You know, it's just like the idea of funerals being for the living, not so much for the dead. There are a lot of brief, but really, really good dream sequences here. I think some of the better dream sequences in the whole show come from this episode, uh, you know, especially in the car with Ralphie and the caterpillar and of course the incredible uh, moment where Tony sees the the mysterious woman uh, at the top of the stairs. I, I love that moment. It is very eerie. One of the most um, haunting moments I think in the entire show which is really saying something uh, and of course we will see that image mirrored later in in the final season in part one in particular. And even just the way he wakes up you know kind of in this feverish like you know he's afraid he goes into the bathroom and it has that real kind of harsh lighting, goes out and it's very bright, almost like a, a rebirth of sorts. It is reminiscent maybe of the ending of the episode, whoever did this. And so, I don't know, I just think even though not that much happens in this episode, uh, just in terms of plot, so much in terms of feeling is here. And uh, I don't know, I find it just really an incredibly dense episode emotionally. Next, I'm going to talk about Cold Cuts and this is season five, episode 10. And uh, I like this episode just because I think, when I think about the episode, I think about just, it's in a different area than it normally is. You know, so much of The Sopranos is in a really ugly, gray, urban area. And uh, this, you know, you get taken out of that world a little bit, and you get taken out into this beautiful kind of green, lush countryside uh, in New York. And it does have that feeling of, like, me 
going back to visit my grandmother when I'm a child out in, you know, a field out in her little house. And it's just real quiet and you get away from the city and it, it has that feeling. It is, um, I know I use the word haunting a lot, but there is so much that is haunting in, in The Sopranos. And there's something about the quietness and, and just all of that that I think is really powerful. And you can almost feel the whispers of the dead underneath. But also, you know, it says so much about, you know, Tony Soprano, because this is an episode where, uh, you know, he's going back to face a lot of his past, as is Christopher, as is Tony Blondetto. And there's a lot of really interesting dynamics there. Tony revealing just how jealous and angry he is as a human being um, when he sees the other people around him trying to make their lives better. And he just, he, he can't stand it. And I think in particular it is with Janice, but also with Christopher. I don't know, I find myself really heartbroken for Christopher here, which is something I never thought I would say. You know, the first time I ever saw, saw The Sopranos, of course, I was deeply compelled by Christopher. He was and is one of my favorite characters. Uh, but just as a person, he's very, 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 very unlikable and hard to root for. However, I just think, you know, seeing him want to change, want to move on, and even if, you know, obviously it seems like a really ridiculous idea, we know he's never going to get out of this life. At least he tries. He tries a lot harder than Tony Soprano. And that sort of thing, the way they pick at him, is very, very sad. It's very abusive, and you just see somebody helpless who's never going to get out of their situation. And he was surrounded by people who weren't helping. And I think that's really evident in this episode. It's a nice kind of way to bring Tony Blundetto and Christopher together and also kind of pin them against each other. I have to talk about the episode in Camelot, and that was season five, episode seven, an episode I always loved. I loved from the moment I saw it, and I even when I was watching it, I was thinking, you know, this seems like one that people, you know, probably flew under the radar and probably still does. And I do not know why more people don't talk about that episode. I think in part it's because it is like calling all cars in the sense that not that much is happening in the episode, but yet so much is happening uh, in the episode psychologically. And I've always been more drawn to that. You know, Sopranos is more psychological, less pro plot driven. So maybe that is why I gravitate towards it. Um, though when I watched this episode, I always thought that Matthew Weiner wrote it. You know, of course, he is the, the head creator of Mad Men, but he also wrote for The Sopranos. It feels like a very Mad Men type of episode to me, but no, he did not write it, so that that's interesting. But um, it's a beautifully written episode, and I think it says more about, you know, kind of the Freudian implications of Tony Soprano and just the way he views his mother and his father. Uh, I think it's one of the more revealing ones, especially in terms of the way he views women, because naturally here he is meeting uh, his father's old Gumar, his old mistress. And of course, he's romanticizing her the way that uh, his father did. And, you know, he realizes how much he kind of romanticized his father as well, but had this deep hatred for his mother without really kind of understanding her point of view and where she came from. And there's something about the way he gravitates towards Fran, this mistress, that is just really creepy. It's very, you know, yeah, you know Freudian, naturally, very incestuous. Uh, but I, I love it. I love it, especially the moment where she wears that JFK hat and starts singing happy birthday to him in that role, like, sexy Marilyn Monroe sort of way. That is terrifying. That, for me, is one of the most disturbing moments in the show. Again, that's saying a lot, because The Sopranos I find to be deeply uh, disturbing a lot of the time, but that moment just, ugh, like, it never left me. It feels almost dreamlike. There's something about the way it's shot and the way it just kind of hones in on this moment. It leaves you breathless. And looking at Tony's face and just the how it twists in from you know, discomfort to kind of loathing, I find to be really, really interesting. And also, just even after all that happens, he still romanticizes her to his friends because that's what you do. That's what people like that do. And I love the moment at the very end where he's smoking the cigar and you see the bada bing, you know, dancers in the background. He kind of you know, blows and it looks like the smoke is like kind of overlapping them. I think it's a beautiful shot. Really, really underrated episode. Next I'm going with uh, Marco Polo, which is season five, episode eight. And I, clearly I have a lot of season five on here for some reason. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if this one's necessarily that underrated. I just don't, I guess I don't hear it talked about that much. And I don't know, it kind of surprised me. For some reason I see this episode as very comforting. 
Uh, I really like episodes of shows or movies where you have like a big ensemble where there's going to be a big climactic point that takes place over, you know, like during a party, you know, and, and that's what happens here. It's very ro like Robert Altman. And I love that because you have all these different characters coming together who all have their own storylines going on. And here they're all going to kind of combine and they're going to interweave and it's going to become very dynamic and very interesting. A lot of moving parts all at once. Those are very hard uh, to write very hard to choreograph and so when they do work I really I really respond to it and I do love this because yes there's a lot of different storylines going on here I mean the main ones are obviously with you know Carmela and Tony uh, but there's obviously the ones with her and her parents uh, big one for Tony Blondetto this is really where he you know starts to shift and realize that screw these people and he really starts to distance himself at this point uh but you know i think it's all handled really really well and again i, I think it you know it's just a personal taste thing but i just really am drawn to episodes like that that are done very well i for some reason it's like a really good one that i like to watch on the holidays as an example the comfort of that italianness i think is is something that is appealing to everyone naturally because so much of the movie or sorry, the movie the show so much of the show is about family both you know business-wise, but real family as well. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, Mr. Ruggiero's Neighborhood, which is season three, episode one. And I think that, you know, when I talk about The Sopranos overall, I think most people, for me, I was hooked from episode one, like absolutely hooked. It had me in the palm of its hands, but I know that a lot of people feel differently. It takes people some time to really get into this because it is, you know, it's an older show. The pacing of shows now is perhaps a little bit different nowadays uh, overall. Um, but yes, I do think that season three is where things, that's where you really start to hone in. People, if you weren't um, completely diehard for The Sopranos, by season three, that's when it really starts to happen. I think it's maybe one of the best seasons of the entire series. And I just love this opening episode. I think it's so clever. It's so interesting. It's something I didn't see coming. I love that we see everything from the point of view of the FBI, rather than Tony Soprano, rather than anybody in the immediate family. It's a nice shift for us um, because it allows us to see things, obviously, from the outside. In a way, that's just really fun. The movement of the episode is just really, really interesting and very cinematic, especially for its time. There's a really great sense of tension, obviously humor as well. You know, humor is is prevalent in The Sopranos, but I think it's interesting because, you know, it, it almost feels like the, you know, viewing it from a spectator because, you know, like most viewers, we're looking for the bang, we're looking for the big melodramatic moment, and so much of The Sopranos is about the incidental, the in-between, often breaking the internal logic within the show, but always for a very interesting reason, I think at least. But here you have the same thing, you have this FBI that is wanting to find that nugget, they want to find something to be able to pin on Tony Soprano, and yet they get nothing. They get them talking about bunions, talking about dinner, talking about, you know, whatever, just the most silly, ridiculous things. And I, I don't know, I think that that's kind of an interesting commentary. But also one thing that I love and something that, you know, is I think people don't really talk about that often is that Tony Soprano almost gets killed in this episode. Patsy Parisi almost kills him when he is drunk and he literally has the gun pointed right at him. And I love that because normally in any other show, this would be a finale. This would be... Or, or, you know, maybe the episode before the finale, we'll, we'll say. This would be a huge climactic moment. Oh my God, Tony Soprano is about to get shot. It is a season opener, not even seen from the point of view of Tony or Patsy Parisi. It is seen from the point of view of the FBI. And that is so interesting to me, uh, just like so much of the show. Again, so much of like the things that you think you're supposed to see, you don't see especially at the very end and the very last episode of the show. And I'll say it before, you know, when I showed my my friend this show, uh, I love what he had to say about it. Just saying that this show, um, you know, seems to understand the weight of death, you know, how impactful it is, and yet how, at the same time, it means nothing. Life, in a way, almost means nothing. And it seems to capture the perfect um, dynamic between, you know, those two contrasting ideas. The incidental and the impactful. And sometimes those things can be uh, interchangeable. So I think that's a really cool idea here. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I know people like the episode, but uh, I do think it's underrated. I think it's just a brilliant opener to a season. And the season would just grow and get better. It's a really, 
it's a spectacular season. But yeah, those are a few. And there are others, you know, I think about, you know, there are episodes in season one that I really like, and especially in, in season six as well. And there's tons throughout that I, I love, but those are just a few, five there. And for people out there that are big Sopranos fans, let me know what some of your uh, most underrated episodes are, just because I find it really interesting to see, is there a pattern between them? But yeah, that is the video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Over here, you will see my patrons. Thank you guys so much for all your support. If you are interested in becoming a patron, the link to support that is below, as well as the rest of my social media information. You can watch more videos here, and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.